We are at the Aging and Healthy Lifestyle Conference at Harvard Medical School with Aubrey de Grey, who's a gerontologist, the Chief Scientific Officer of SENS, which we'll explain in a moment, and is an organization that looks at human regenerative engineering. Out on the newsstands right now are a number of magazines. Um, here's Discover, Can We Cure Aging? Here's one that's called The Aging Cure. Uh, slow-burning fuse about the increase in aging populations from The Economist. The idea of aging as a disease, are you comfortable with that? The idea of aging as a condition that is a legitimate target of medicine, I'm certainly comfortable with. I tend to be a little bit careful about using the word disease because different people just have different definitions of that term. And according to some of those definitions, aging would be a disease, and according to others, it might not be. Um, but certainly as something that's a target of medicine, absolutely, no question. All right. Would you unpack SENS for me as certainly. well? Certainly. SENS is an acronym. It stands for Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence. And that sounds terribly convoluted, and that's why we use the acronym. Um, but ultimately, it, um, it came from a, a term that was coined by a very famous gerontologist from Los Angeles, Tuck Finch, about um, 20 years ago now the simple term negligible senescence, which is a term that he used for um, species which exhibit so little um, evidence of aging in the wild, especially in terms of the age structure of the wild populations, that one cannot actually determine statistically that they are aging at all. Um, engineered negligible senescence then is simply um, the concept whereby one might take a species that does exhibit aging, like for example the human race, and transform them by, by technology into a species that does not exhibit aging. So, strategies for engineering negligible senescence, does that mean slowing the clock? Or? It's more than slowing the clock. It actually means in the long term stopping the clock. When I say the long term, what I mean is it's really a, an oscillation between letting the clock run at its normal rate and then reversing the clock periodically, actually repairing the various aspects of aging, aspects of molecular and cellular damage that have been created by metabolism so that their overall level of abundance over the long term does not increase at all. So at one end, I, this is from your talk, you, at one end you have gerontology, which is the science of metabolism and so on and so forth, longevity. At the other end you have the pathology, the diseases that take us out, and in the middle you have damage. Is your yep. is your thesis and the damage as I understand it is is where you want to apply the acupressure point that's exactly correct yes it seems after a lot of analysis I realized that actually this seems to be the weak link in the whole process that um, clearly you know being dead is a side effect of being alive uh, pathology emerges progressively as time goes on and it must be as a consequence of normal metabolic processes um, but, of course, there must be some sort of cascade going on there. There must be some initial side effects of normal metabolic processes that lead to other things, or otherwise we would have the, con the phenomenon of seeing the um, uh, diseases of aging occur at younger ages as well as at older ages, and they don't. So there must be some sort of initially harmless intermediates that are being created throughout life um, as um, side effects of metabolism, and that are initially harmless, as I say, simply because they're not abundant enough to get in the way of metabolism, so to speak. And eventually they become abundant enough that they do get in the way, and that's when pathology starts to emerge. One can draw that conclusion just completely in the abstract without looking at any biology at all. But then if one takes that conclusion and goes back and does look at the biology, then sure enough, exactly the things that people have been studying in gerontology for goodness knows how long fit this um, this description very well. We can see that, for example, there are certain tissues in which just molecular garbage accumulates uh, in ways that we understand from a, a down-to-earth biological level what's going on, why they accumulate, and also why they're eventually harmful. But when we come to thinking about what to do, um, these three alternatives, what I call the gerontology approach, the geriatrics approach, and the maintenance approach, come, come out as extremely contrasting approaches. The geriatrics approach is essentially the one disease at a time, try to hit the pathologies, and it's Everyone understands that it's a losing battle. It's better than nothing, but not much better, and it never will be much better than nothing. And this is what has driven gerontologists to try to um, you know, adopt the mantra of, pre of prevention being better than cure, 
and to do what you just said earlier, namely actually trying to slow the clock, trying to make metabolism be cleaner and create these various types of molecular and cellular damage more slowly than it naturally would. And that is a fine idea in principle, but it's incredibly difficult unless you are satisfied with doing the relatively modest amount of intervention that the body is already equipped to do in response to certain environmental cues, particularly famine. Um, if you want to go beyond what the body, body already knows how to do, then we basically just don't know a millionth as, as much as we need to about metabolism in order to be able to do less harm than good by manipulating it. So I say we should go for this third approach, the, the um, maintenance approach, the engineering approach, which is to let metabolism do its thing, um, creating these various types of damage, and then to actually go in and repair, or in some cases to make harmless, that damage so that it never reaches the level of abundance that begins to initiate these pathologies of old age. So this middle phase, these are the things, you, you would these call these things the seven deadly things, and exactly. you see this as I understand it as, as seven fixes that could be made, technological fixes that could be made, each of which would buy you another lease on life. And eventually, if you manage to get all of those things fixed, I have seen the figure of a thousand years out there. Okay, so first of all, let's be clear that one, each one individually of these things will probably give only a very negligible degree of um, postponement of age-related ill health because they, are, they underpin a wide variety of different pathologies, but they underpin different ones. So, um, you know, it may alter the uh, partitioning of causes of death, but it won't have a significant effect more than a year or two on, um, on the average age at death or the average age at which ill health starts to set in. Um, unless we hit most of them and probably all of them. But once we hit all of them, we're in a position where there is no accumulation of these types of damage as time goes on, and therefore no increase in risk of th these pathologies. The ill health of old age will be initiated and will progress. If we're in that situation, then yes, if you press me, I will give you a number for how long we would like, be likely to live on average, and it will be around a thousand years because we can look at the statistics for what kill people in the Western world today who are in young adulthood, and if you just take that as a constant number, as a half-life if you like, we can work out how long on average people would live, and it's around a thousand years, plus or minus a factor of two or something like that, depending on what data you use. Um, but of course, that's a bit of a distraction, because I don't work on getting people to live a long time for the sake of living a long time. I work on keeping people healthy, and the living a long time thing is purely a side benefit. The reason it's a big side benefit is because I think that we can actually develop in the foreseeable future therapies that will allow us to stay healthy really, really comprehensively. So that's really the only thing that distinguishes my work and my foundation's work from the rest of the medical profession. All right, so tell me about the Methuselah Mouse Prize since we're on So the about six years ago, I met a businessman named David Goebel who was based in Virginia, and between the two of us, we started the Methuselah Foundation. And our purpose was to promote, obviously, and hasten research to develop the sorts of therapies that I think were necessary to actually um, achieve this postponement of age-related ill health. And we realized that starting out with essentially no money at all, there was only one really promising option, which was to get people interested by not talking too much about science. And prizes are great for this. They are things that people relate to, world records, prizes, that sort of thing, even if they can't really concentrate on science for very long. Plus also, prizes have an enormous actual track record for incentivizing scientists or technologists to do things that they weren't otherwise doing and to spend a lot more money in many cases than the, um, than the, pr than the amount of prize that's on offer. Um, so the thing started off really as a public relations exercise because we didn't have enough money in the prize pot to, f to be able to incentivize anybody. But the amount grew because, of course, we had a page where you could donate money and add to it. And it's now up around four and a half million dollars or so mm. and, um, and still growing. And, you know, it's making a bit of a difference. There are certainly some people doing experiments um, to extend mouse lifespan that they wouldn't be doing otherwise. So that's nice. Um, however, of course, the um, Ma Methuselah Mass Prize is not the only activity that the Methuselah Foundation used to do. It also was focused very much on developing, on, on sponsoring research, on being a regular funding body. 
and um, just as of about six months ago, we decided to actually change that structure and create a new foundation, the Sense Foundation, which is the thing that I'm Chief Science Officer of now, and the Methuselah Foundation divested its research funding uh, um, um, activities to the new foundation. So now the Methuselah Foundation is more or less back to how it was originally, focusing on the M Prize, on the Methuselah Mouse Prize, and I'm no longer affiliated with the Methuselah Foundation. It's all very amicable, you understand. It's just a better way of marketing the whole thing, a better way of doing the messaging and doing the organizational stuff. Well, yeah, but how much, how much um, importance do you attach to lifestyle changes, things like res calorie restriction and so on? The reason I ask this is that at a meeting we were at recently on epigenetics and so on, I, I talked to Angie ba Andy Bartke, right, who has the Methuselah Mouse Prize. And he was, in fact, stressing the fact that, that, um, that he thought, I think I'm correctly re remembering this, that the, the care that happens in the animal care facilities was actually a huge impact in, in its, the, the, the mouth's longevity. So. Okay, so um, lifestyle, well, okay, we have to ask two questions here. One is, what effect environmental and dietary and such like um, influences might have on humans, and the other is the effect that they might have in the laboratory. Now, in the laboratory, Andy's completely right, it's now well established, actually, that certain environmental variables, in particular, simply how interesting the environment is, how varied it is, make an incredible amount of difference. There's a famous case where another top um, gerontologist in the UK this time, Tom Kirkwood, moved his laboratory from Manchester to Newcastle, and in Newcastle they had a, a pre-existing um, gerontology community and a mouse house that was run by a guy who just really liked his mice. And he used to play with them when he was changing the bedding and he used to put toys in the cages and change the toys every few days and generally make the lives of the mice interesting. And the colony of mice that, my, that Tom brought from Manchester to Newcastle was already a very respectably long-lived colony by the standards of the strain that he had. And they gained another six months of average lifespan, which basically means that they went up by the equivalent of 15 years in humans. I mean, just an insane amount. And the thing is, this is, I mean, obviously it's an incredibly interesting result, but it's much more than interesting. It's incredibly important because what it says is that if you try to compare the results given, obtained in one laboratory versus another, you can't just say that they are easy to compare because they use the same strain of mice and they fed them the same chow and so on. You've got to look at the environment that they were in and how they were, how they were housed and so on really carefully. Because even a difference of a month or two months in average lifespan can be a big deal in an experiment on mice. And if we're getting six months by something that's not normally controlled for at all, which is this sort of environmental quality, then, you know, it's, it's crazy. And I'm actually pretty angry with Tom for, for not over the... Year, several years now since this was discovered for not getting his act together and getting the word out and getting some publications on this. You know, he's sensitive, as well, many scientists are, to the possibility of putting something out that didn't have a control group properly and so on, but he does understand in principle the fact that this is an incredibly important piece of information and, you know, he's told, he, he's told me a number of times that, yes, he very much intends to get it out, but somehow it never happens, so I think he's been a bit naughty that way. And there are, in fact, uh, pretty well-known cases of enriched environments in other, other, other species, and uh, I, th I think it's the, the, the message is already making its way into schoolrooms, isn't it? That right, so the, 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 if we get on to what the effect would be in humans of this, uh, well, the, the extent to which that sort of change might actually influence longevity in humans, I think we have to be a good deal more equivocal. At this point, I think this may be one of those cases where, um, you know, the effects are bigger in shorter lived organisms than in longer lived organisms. There's very good evolutionary reasons to suppose that that's going to be the case for dietary alterations, in particular calorie restriction. We can just look at the reasons why calorie restriction exists in the first place, or should I say, why the life extension um, response to calorie restriction exists in the first place. And we can see that it must be genetically controlled, which means there are genes for it that are you know, have, have evolved and have been maintained through evolutionary time and so we can ask well okay what's the selective pressure for that and to me it's actually pretty clear that the selective pressure is weaker in a longer lived organism than it is in a, in a shorter lived organism. Um, I think the same sort of thing may very well apply to other lifestyle things. Anything that would be influenced um, 
as a result of some sim simple environmental change like you know, environmental you know, richness. So one of the things that I asked a number of the participants at the um, systems biology meeting, the epigenetics meeting that we, were, that we attended, um, because I found this a little bit confusing, there seemed to be no clear agreement about whether there was a, an agreed theory of aging. Um, I think it's because the question is not very well formed. Um, you know, what is a theory of aging? You could say, well, a theory of aging is the hypothesis that such and such a mechanism dominates the determination of, wh of what age um, certain Ill health, uh, aspects of ill health emerges. Um, so we could say that the mitochondrial theory of aging says that the accumulation of mitochondrial mutations is the dominant timer of the arrival of age related pathologies. So that's a theory, it's a hypothesis. Um, unfortunately, it's pretty clear that all such hypotheses are wrong because there are many different uh, mechanistic things that are going on, accumulations of various types of damage, the way I like to describe it, each of which has a significant contribution to the age at which ill health emerges. Um, so all those theories are wrong. But if we make a weaker definition of, of um, theory of aging, which is the hypothesis that such and such a mechanism um, has some significant contribution to the age at which Ill, Ill health emerges, then pretty much all uh, theories of aging are right. So this is basically why it's not a well-formed question. So the notion of an accumulation of deleterious mutations? That's just one theory. You know, mutations in the mitochondrial DNA is one theory, mutations in the nuclear DNA is another theory, but they're not really, the point is they're not theories in the normal sense that we understand the word because they're not mutually exclusive. If we define the, if we, if we say what sort of standard of, of, um, of theory we need, in other words how strongly these, these various things contribute to um, to the, uh, as I say, the age at which ill health emerges, then they're all sort of intermediate. They all, they all satisfy a weak definition of theory and then none of them satisfy a strong definition that says the thing is dominant. So do you think there's an inherent cap on human lifespan that we have a use-by date? Or? There is undoubtedly a, a cap on human lifespan. I think that the, r there, there is a basal rate of accumulation of these various types of damage which, can, which we cannot go below because it is a consequence, an inevitable consequence, of aspects of lifestyle that are not negotiable, like breathing and eating, you know, things like that. Uh, especially breathing, of course. Um, you know, breathing is awfully bad for you. It's, 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 it, <laughs> you know, it's the main source of toxic free radicals. Um, so, um, absolutely. Of course, that it, 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 one has to be really not very clever to say that because there is this warranty period on how the body is naturally, therefore, there's no way that medicine will ever, do, ever exceed that warranty period. That's obviously complete nonsense. In the same way that it's nonsense to say that a car can't last more than it's more than, uh, longer than it was designed to last. Um, but it, it, what it does tell us is that it's pretty damn difficult to get the human body to live substantially beyond that about that amount of time. See, because some of the people who have specifically said no, we don't think there is a. Um you know, a limit on human... On okay, so th some people are a bit sloppy in my view about this. During the first half of the 20th century, there was a rapid increase of life expectancy that had, as far as we can tell, not much to do with ageing. It was mainly caused by elimination or rapid reduction in the incidence of death at a very early age, especially in infancy and, and in childbirth. Um, but since then, in the second half of the 20th century and beyond, there has continued to be a slower but still very encouraging increase in the rate at which, um, uh, increase in the, in the life expectancy in the, across the whole industrialized world. And a lot of people are extrapolating simplistic, simplistically from this and saying, well, this looks very much as though we're just going to be able to keep on going. I think that is definitely oversimplistic. I think what we can say is that this during this period we have enjoyed an increase in longevity that has resulted from staying biologically young, younger than we used to be, throughout our entire life. There's a, hypo there's a name for one of these hypotheses, it's called the fetal origins hypothesis, and it essentially says that a lot of the um, influence over the age at which age-related problems emerges, um, age-related problems emerge, comes from how one got on prenatally from prenatal nutrition and such like. And there are, of course, many other what are called cohort effects, things that uh, are different, not necessarily prenatally, but in early life, like, for example, whether one took up smoking at an early age uh, that may considerably affect various aspects of one's health at a much later age. 
that my belief is that it's those sorts of effects that are dominating the um, increase that we've seen in the past 50, 60 years in lifespan, that it's just that people who are dying now have spent their entire lives healthier at, at any given chronological age than people who were 50 years older in the same country. And that, of course, is something that we would not expect to continue indefinitely. We would expect that actually we may be hitting the top, top end of that already. Um, and things may be leveling off. And in fact, there's already hints of that in the statistics that we're seeing. One statistic that a lot of people get very pessimistic about is if we look today at the average age, let's say in the past couple of years, at which people are dying, and we also look at the average age at which people are falling into age-related ill health, into some sort of morbidity as measured by activities of daily living. Um, People are very worried by the fact that life expectancy has continued to go up at this nice encouraging rate and the age of, uh, of onset of morbidity has tended to level off in the past, let's say, 10 or 15 years. Luckily, what this tells us is not that people are spending a longer time in, a healthy state, in an unhealthy state at the end of their lives. All the reason right. it's not telling us that is because it's different sets of people. The, if, let's, say, let's suppose the, that last year the average age of onset of morbidity was 70 and the average age at death was 80, let's suppose. Okay? Now, that means that people who were born 80 years ago are dying on average and people who were born 70 years ago are, getting, are, getting, are falling into morbidity. Different sets of people. Right? But what it does say is that age of onset of morbidity may very well be a sort of canary in the coal mine for age of death. So that I would predict, in fact, that the age of death is going to start leveling off pretty much now um, you know, in the next few years in the industrialized world unless therapies of the sort that I work on come along because we're going to have to do something qualitatively different in order to keep, this, to keep the curve going, keep life expectancy continuing to rise in order to, um, you know, in order to supplant this thing that we've essentially now solved, namely early life nutrition, early life um, uh, problems that have late life consequences. This, the strategies that you're suggesting, um, when I spoke to David Sinclair about where you guys agreed, where you parted company and so on, I think his major point of departure was to say, look, having set up a company, even with the backing of GlaxoSmithKline, which is a non-trivial enterprise, <laughs> and even with all this money, it's still fiendishly difficult mm -hmm. to get even one of these things rolling. Yep. Aubrey's talking about seven of them. I mean. In fact, it's worse than that. I'm not really only talking about seven. I'm talking about seven categories of thing that we need to do. Right. And within each of those categories, there's lots right. of examples that we need to fix. So it's a hell of a lot. No question. It's very, very hard indeed. And I think the real reason why... We should why live long enough to see this happen. Right. <laughs> and I think the real reason why David and I are so supportive of each other's work is because we both appreciate the complementarity that exists. That David's focus is on things that may only have rel relatively modest effects, but certainly effects that are worth having, and they're pretty easy compared to what I do, in fact, they're very easy compared to what I work on to actually implement, so we may be there within a few years. Um, whereas I'm working on things that are much harder to implement, but as and when we get them implemented, they will shoot things like what David does out of the, out of the sky. So if you just take that into account, a hard thing that's going to really, really be massively effective and an easy thing that's going to be only modestly effective, then obviously the thing that's best overall um, that will save the most lives, that will alleviate the most suffering and, and save the most money eh, in terms of economic benefits of all of this. The best solution is to do both of these things as fast as we can so that as many people as possible live long enough to um, benefit from the really hard therapies that I work on and that people are allowed to do that, enabled to do that by having access a lot earlier to the sorts of things that um, David works on that allows them to have a better chance of making the cut, so to speak. The meetings that I've been to recently, I just mentioned to you, systems biology meeting, the epigenetics meeting, very difficult to, to get a sense of any consensus mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. A lot of experts talking, using alphabet soup, daft this and tor that and so on and so forth. Um, so as one sits and watches the administration trying to get through a health bi bill, uh, you know that the general level of understanding mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. of diet, nutrition, metabolism, aging is pretty rudimentary. Right. So the question is, how do you actually manage to, 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 to sort of get a grip on that? How do you manage to convey to a large audience enough information to allow them to make an informed decision or give an informed opinion 
to administration, since this is a democracy, mm -hmm. that's supposed to be guarding their lives, if you want to put it there? I, I think it's an excellent question. And um, I, I, to a very real extent, I think that gerontologists are their own worst enemies in all of this, because they haven't really bitten the bullet and, un, uh, and, and taken on an understanding that they need to define their field more appropriately for public consumption. By more appropriately, I mean they need to accept that gerontology is not simply a basic science. It's a basic science with applicability to the real world, and therefore gerontologists need to be technologists as well as scientists. They need to think in goal-directed ways as well as thinking in basic science curiosity-driven ways. And most gerontologists, especially most senior ones, are very, very reluctant to do that. They are basic scientists at heart. They celebrate their ignorance. Scientists like to know how much they don't know because it's, new, it's, it's stuff they can carry on working on, whereas technologists like to celebrate how much they do know so that they can actually try applying it. And we're on that cusp at the moment. Aging is a really, really complicated phenomenon, no question about that. And actually addressing it, actually manipulating it, is really tough. But how tough? We don't know until we actually try. And you know, the mindsets involved in being a technologist versus a basic scientist are subtly different. It's the reason why um, very often the people who make technological breakthroughs are not the same people who actually develop the knowledge that was used to underpin those breakthroughs. At the moment, the sorts of lack of consensus that you're encountering are really because people don't care about the answer. People more care about being almost, almost, almost arguing about it as a philosophical point. You know, what is aging? You know, who gives a damn what aging is? What matters is age-related ill health. Okay, what matters is at the fundamental level, it's a process of accumulation of damage throughout life that eventually causes pathologies. No one would actually argue with that definition, but if you ask people a priori to define aging, they won't give you that definition because it doesn't fit the way that they like to think about aging. And that's pathetic, really. You know, if they just were down to earth about it and said, listen, this is what we want to fix, this is what we want to achieve in the long run at a concrete physical level, you know, molecular and cellular level, then funding would be, it would be, would be forthcoming. The problem is it will entail a lot of restructuring of the field, in particular a lot of education of gerontologists by people who do not currently call themselves gerontologists because they work in other areas of biology, other areas of medicine. People who work in regenerative medicine are particularly important in this area because ultimately aging is a, an accumulation of degeneration and therefore its, um, its remedy especially if we were thinking about reversing it rather than retarding it, does c consist of doing regenerative medicine applied to aging, which is essentially what I focus on. But getting other people to accept this blinding truth, other people who call themselves gerontologists, is unbelievably hard. And until that is accepted, it's no surprise at all that it's a losing battle trying to get more money from the public purse or indeed from the private sector um, into this field. All right. So, um let me just uh, go back and look at this. Uh, this, this is uh, Sherwin Newland's book, The Art of Aging, and it has in here a, 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 a section which is somewhat of a profile of you, which I guess came from the, largely the Technology Review That's article. Right. Um, um, and this is one of, and I know you won't mind me saying this, uh, one of a number of uh, fairly contentious issues that have risen up as you started doing your evangelism. Um, you've been called everything from a crackpot to God knows what else. I mean, it, 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 it says here whether one chooses to believe that he's a brilliant and prophetic architect of futuristic bi biology or merely a misguided and quite nutty theorist, there can be no doubt about the astonishing magnitude of his intellect. But those two, those two nice thing at the end, but the, the two things in between, there, there does, you do seem to be a lightning rod, Aubrey. Well, <laughs> w w one could say that Sherwin Newland is, a, is a, a master of damning with faint praise. But, um, <laughs> oh, but praising with faint damn. Or something along those lines, that's right. Uh, but yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't have any objection to being a lightning rod. I think I'm, to a certain extent, I regard it as an achievement. I think if you're working in any area of, um, uh, uh, of innovation, whether it be scientific or otherwise, and nobody is pissed off with you, then you probably aren't making much of a difference. You probably aren't really being terribly successful. So I, I feel it's a real a measure that I am making a difference. It's, uh, he also made the point here that um, for reasons that memory cannot retrieve, de Grey has been convinced since childhood that aging is, in his words, something we need to fix. Since childhood, I mean, how does one 
well, start I, thinking about this? I, I think thinking is the operative word here. I don't think I ever did think about it. I mean, I never thought about the colour of the sky. I never thought about the fact that you know, gravity is probably the same strength on both sides of the planet. It was just went without saying. And people didn't talk about it, but why should they? I mean, it's just sort of, how could ageing not be a legitimate theoretical target in principle of medicine. It's just obviously something that goes wrong with the body and things that go wrong with the body are what medicine is there to fix. Why should ageing be an exception? It just doesn't make sense. And it never occurred to me that anyone else would think otherwise. So is this the age, I mean, is, is this during childhood that you decide that you will be a scientist of some description? Absolutely. Well, I, I, of some description, yes. I realized at the age of maybe eight or nine or ten, something like that, that I wanted to be a scientist. And that was essentially because I realized that I wanted to make a difference to the world. I didn't really know why I wanted to make a difference, and I still don't know why I want to make a difference. But I don't care that I don't know why, it's just the way I'm built, and that's fine. Um, but that's what I want to do, and clearly scientists make more difference to the world than anybody else. And I like to work on hard problems, I don't, I'm not scared of them, so I started off working on um, artificial intelligence, and uh, I made some breakthroughs there over the years, in, uh, in my early twenties. But when I discovered, to my absolute horror, that people in general, and biologists in particular, more or less to a man, did not actually regard ageing the way I did, and did not regard it as something particularly interesting, let alone particularly important, I was horrified and I decided, well, I've got to switch fields, really, and here I am. So, the ageing part was, uh, and the genetics and all the concomitant disciplines were largely self-taught. I was very lucky that I got into the, this, um, this whole thing as a result of meeting and marrying a biologist, and furthermore a biologist a lot older than me, she's 19 years older than me, she was already a full professor actually at UC San Diego when we met, and she was on sabbatical in the UK. Um, so obviously very natural teacher, lots of teaching experience, didn't really even teach me biology by, on purpose, it was really just a case of talking about what she did today each day, um, and just enjoying the conversation. But it came all, all out of that, and certainly the, the, she didn't know anything to speak of about gerontology, and there were lots of things that one needs to understand pretty well um, about biology that she also didn't know, like she didn't know any biochemistry to speak of, and I certainly taught myself biochemistry entirely. Um, but that's really easy sort of thing to teach yourself if you know genetics, and she's a geneticist, so she, I started off being taught the hard parts and going on from there. Uh, my recollection is that um, you wrote a thesis, a book. I wrote a book in 1990, yeah. About Sorry, mitochondria, about mitochondria. Yeah, 99. Um, and as a, as a consequence of that, th there are still some universities like Cambridge which will give you a PhD because you've written a good book. Well, of course, the book is evaluated just the way a thesis is evaluated. Yes. So I had a thesis committee and I did an oral defense of the thesis, same as anyone would normally do. But yes, you're quite right. If you've done your undergraduate degree at Cambridge, more than three years ago, then you're entitled to submit published work of any sort, um, uh, whether it's a book or a collection of journal articles, for example, and um, they're evaluated, can be evaluated just as if they were a PhD dissertation, without your ever having actually been registered as a PhD student. Uh, rather amusingly, the, um, the other really well-known gerontologist from the UK, Tom Kirkwood, got his PhD in exactly the same way. He was originally a mathematician at Cambridge, I was a computer scientist, and we both got our PhDs by this method. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, we have spoken to Tom, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, of the various people I've spoken to, um, Finch, Kirkwood, you, you'll see the list, um, who's, who would you say is most aligned with, with your views? Well, of course, I'd have to see the list in order to know that. Um, right. But out of senior gerontologists, high-profile gerontologists, there is a wide spectrum. There are people at the very much, uh, very much the um, uh, my, my more vocal detractors, but there aren't very many of them left. Tom is quite a vocal detractor. Uh, Rich Miller is very vocal. He regards me as the devil incarnate, more or less. Um, but on the other side of the spectrum, um, people like David Sinclair are pretty damn positive about what I, what I do. They understand that what I'm trying to do is extraordinarily difficult, but they understand the complementarity between my approach and their approach. Um, there are quite a few people who are beginning to call themselves gerontologists, but who started off thinking more of themselves as regenerative medicine specialists and who are very supportive of what I do. People like Tony Atala, for example, a pioneer of tissue engineering. Quite a few people working in stem cell research take this view. People like Stephen Minger and Chris Mason. And now if you go to our um, um, website and you can see our research advisory board, it's 15 people that are all extremely authoritative, prestigious people 
maybe half of them would call themselves gerontologists, maybe the other half would call themselves regenerative medicine specialists, but their, their um, prestige and um, authority is completely unassailable. So there's a, a wide spectrum. You've probably heard this criticism before, but a, a number of people did suggest that they found the idea of, you know, the 1,000 year man and so on, all those various ideas. Um, I think the word that they were used was, was actually elitist, that, that, you know, here you are trying to create this sort of situation where you go on forever and uh, combating normal processes and so on. And I mean, you must have heard that criticism before. I hear that sort of criticism from non-biologists. Um, I think for a gerontologist to say such a thing just means they want to get you off the phone, to be perfectly honest, because ultimately they know perfectly well, just as well as I'm telling you, that I don't work on getting people to live a long time for the sake of getting them to live a long time. I work on keeping people healthy, and I don't meet anyone who actually wants to get Alzheimer's disease or cancer or whatever. The only difference between what I say and do and what other people do in the whole of the medical profession, including gerontology, is I think we have a plan that in the foreseeable future we'll be able to do that job of keeping people healthy so well that the side benefit will be that we will live a very great deal longer than we do at the moment on average. But of course that doesn't mean that that's what I work on. It just means it's a side benefit. And if people like you want to ask me how long I think people are going to live on average, then I will give a straight answer. But I think it's rather childish, to be perfectly honest, for my colleagues in gerontology to hold that against me, that I give straight answers to straight questions. Do you, um, do you practice any of, any of the um, standard techniques for allegedly, uh, that, that will allegedly work to extend lifespan? Well, of course, there are no standard techniques that will allegedly work particularly well Calorie in terms restriction. of any sort of significant increase in longevity for people who are already doing okay. If you have something uh, that's unusually wrong with you, like, for example, Ray Kurzweil came down with type 2 diabetes in his 30s, then certainly it makes sense to try to use existing technologies to try to, uh, to normalize that aspect of one's aging, and Ray certainly succeeded in doing that very well. Um, but I'm unusually lucky in terms of how I'm aging. I've done all these standard tests a few times and I'm definitely well below my chronological age when it comes to my biological age. And of course in that situation when we appreciate how very poorly we understand how metabolism really works, the, um, you know, the maxim that if it ain't broke don't fix it is really a rather powerful one. So I'm very cautious indeed, a very, very um, conservative when it comes to even contemplating doing things other than I've just been doing anyway. Given where you sit at this point. I mean, what are you optimistic about in this field? I'm extremely optimistic about the ability of the regenerative medicine community, broadly defined, to essentially run, the, run with the ball of combating aging. Even though gerontologists, people who call themselves gerontologists, are very sniffy still about really embracing the applicability of regenerative medicine to the problem of aging, the converse is not true. People who work in regenerative medicine are extremely keen to apply their technologies to the problem of aging. And I see my role in that regard as helping to bring these people together, helping to educate them, uh, helping them to educate each other, if you like, also helping them to see how their particular area of expertise fits into the broader picture. That's the sort of thing I do in my conferences, the sort of thing I do in my journal that I edit. Um, and I'm very optimistic. Things are moving forward in that respect very well. I'm also very optimistic about the social acceptability of all of this. Even in the past few years that I've been doing this, there's been a very, very clear shift to it being, you know, perfectly acceptable dinner time conversation to talk about seriously postponing age-related ill health, which was something that one would like get rather laughed at if one talked about a few years ago. Um, you know, that's a, that's a really big, big change and a really important one. And it will only continue. As I look back, I mean, next year is the 350th anniversary of the Royal Society, mm -hmm. which is basically an instantiation of Francis Bacon's ideas, yeah. right? Bacon, if you look back at, at some of his early writings, 1610, 1620, uh, is described as, as being one of the leading thinkers here by um, Stephen Gaukroger, um, gave more thought to the question of increasing longevity than any, any other natural philosopher of the early modern era. Um, wrote extensively on, on, on aging and, and solving problems of, of uh, you know, lifespan and so on and so forth. Um, 400 years on? Mm -hmm. And I still can't get a clear answer from people about... Ultimately, the problem is that science in general has become too political. And therefore, components of science that 
have enormous social significance have become particularly political. When I say political, what I basically mean is people think about how their words are going to be received by non-scientists more than how they're going to be received by their colleagues because they're worried about where their next grant application is going to go and how it's going to get on. So gerontology for trying to be all things to all men, trying to be too diplomatic, trying to basically you know, keep everyone happy, and the result is they're keeping nobody happy. It's a bit of a scandal, to be perfectly honest. What's happening is that gerontologists are shooting themselves in the foot and failing to capitalize on the priority that society is perfectly willing, in principle, to give what they do because gerontologists are refusing to play the right game. They're refusing to accept that gerontology is both a basic science and a technology, an emerging technology that needs to be treated as a technology. And if they would take the same attitude that happens elsewhere in the medical world, in the biomedical world, by which I mean the world of people trying to pioneer the development of new therapies, not simply to apply existing therapies, then things would move much faster. Uh, that's another big thing that gerontologists can learn from the regenerative medicine community. The regenerative medicine community has gone through plenty of technical ups and downs. Tissue engineering has had a very rocky ride, so has gene therapy, for example. We may, have, we may not have seen the end of the rocky ride of stem cell therapies, but all of those fields have moved forward very effectively and achieved very substantial funding from a wide variety of sources because they have adopted the right happy medium between doing basic science and also applying that basic science and talking about how to apply it and why it's important. Gerontologists would do that, there'd be so much more money in the field, it's not true. All right, so if you have a president who declares in his inaugural address and later in a speech at the National Academy is that part of the, his mission is to restore science to its rightful place, what in your view, 350 years on from the foundation of the Royal Society, is the rightful place of science? The rightful place of science in society is pretty much where the public already think it is, namely as, if you like, the new religion, the area of, in, of human endeavor that determines the future, that leads us into the future. The way in which it's not actually uh, occupying that place today is essentially because it's been progressively under, more and more underfunded, with of course the odd blip here and there. It's become progressively more politicized as a result, with scientists having to think much more about how their words and their actions are viewed by non-scientists than about how they're viewed by scientists. There's simply no meaningful job security in science. It's like having to re-justify one's existence every year. And that's not, that doesn't make for people to actually do creative thinking, which is what science is all about. The rightful place of science in general, I think, is simply to have the top scientists be given the freedom to do science, to actually spend their time thinking and doing experiments and not resubmitting rejected grant applications ad nauseam the way they have to do now. At the moment, some people would say there are too many scientists competing for too little money. But of course, the correct way to put it is there's too little money being competed for by the scientists. And that's a great shame. If there were the sort of grant um, acceptance rates around 30-40% that we used to see not long ago, then science would be a great deal healthier than it is now when it's down around 10%. And, you know, this stimulus package that happened recently sounded like a great idea. And, of course, it is a great thing that there was so much money put into science as a result of that package. But how was that money, act what did that money actually cause to happen? It caused the most enormous avalanche of grant application activity that has ever been seen in the history of science. And a lot of other science that would have been getting done didn't get done because people were too busy meeting deadlines for grant applications. And the actual hit rate for those grant applications was much, much lower, because there were so many of them, than the hit rate for average grant applications. So it was really not time well spent. And I would say it's probably taken a great deal of the heat out of what benefits could have accrued from that stimulus package. The Pew uh, Research Center recently put out a report. Um, they fairly regularly do this, an opinion poll about the relationship between science, general public. Um, unusually this time, instead of just asking the public what they thought of science or what they knew about science, they also asked a group of scientists. Predictably, the uh, the public responses were as you'd expect, that they thought science was a pretty good thing, should be supported and so on, and they, far too many of them didn't know that the sun went, the earth went around the sun and vice versa, rather than vice versa. Um, 
The scientists themselves, however, were, were, it was pretty disparaging about level of public knowledge, mm -hmm. um, and there didn't seem to be much enthusiasm about communicating to a general mm -hmm. audience that actually provide some of the money that they use. Right. So how does one bridge that gap? Well, one thing that one needs to do to bridge that gap is to have appropriate respect for that minority of scientists who enjoy communicating to non-scientists and who are good at it. Um, and in fact, the opposite is the case. Uh, communicating to scientists is often somewhat looked down upon, seen as a bad career move. You know, people say, well, you know, Carl Sagan never got to the National Academy. You know, um, I mean, sure, he didn't get to the National Academy, and it may very well be that he didn't get there because he was a little bit too populist for the likes of the grandees who made such decisions. That, it seems to me, is an appalling indictment of the attitude of senior scientists to, the, to part of their duty.